Hey everybody, what's up? Welcome to the Golf Strategy School podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, thank you so much. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever, awesome. Hey, thanks for listening there too. This podcast is really like the only podcast out there that's designed to help newer golfers who are struggling to get over those milestone scores of breaking 90 or breaking 100. Uh, I want to give a huge shout out to one of our group members, uh, David Hughes. He's been part of my Golf 101 How to Break 90 group, and he has been pretty consistently breaking 90 for a while now. And he just took the next step, and he broke 80. So proud of you, David. That is absolutely awesome. I'm really, really proud that you've been listening, that you've been putting all this into action. So just wanted to shout it out at the top of the episode here. Kudos to you, David. That's amazing. Well done. Fan-freaking-tastic. I'm so proud of you. So what today's episode is, is actually going to be very short and sweet. And it's going to be one very simple, almost silly tip about how you can really improve your green side touch. And I learned it from Hale Irwin. Let's talk about it. All right, so most of you probably know who Hale Irwin is. If you don't, he is one of the most legendary short game players of all time. He was just an amazing putter, and really anything on and around the green, he was just absolutely deadly. It was routine for this guy to be putting down like 40, 50 foot putts. It was just nuts. And I actually had the opportunity to watch him teach a little seminar uh, many, many years ago when I was a kid. And what he did is he shared a tip that it just, it hung with me for over 20 years in my golf game. And I still, to this day, try to think about my greenside chips like this. And so when we talk about, when we talk about putting, when we talk about chipping, they're all kind of in the in the same boat when it comes to dealing with speed because the speed is always going to determine the line. You know, if there's a lot of slope, but the ball's moving a hundred miles an hour, it's not going to break. As my brother used to say, they're all, they're all straight if you hit them hard enough. But what it comes down to is really making sure that you've got good touch all around the green, because you might have that ball like perfectly dead on, But if you only get it halfway there on a 30 foot chip, now you've got a 15 foot putt left. And that's not something that's, that's going to be a highly converting putt unless you're Hale Irwin. But what, what he did is he told this group, it was just the most basic, most simple thing. He goes, take a golf ball in your hand, throw it at the cup, just throw it underhand at the cup. Okay. Everybody was pretty, you know, pretty good within 10 feet for sure. And this was a, this was a group of kids. I was a junior golfer at the time. And so it was just this, this very basic, like, you know, throw it underhand, kind of bowl it out there. We were all standing, you know, roughly five feet off the edge of the green. And so all these golf balls come raining down and they roll out and they all, for the most part, stayed reasonably close to the cup. You know, some of them were in their tap-in range. Some of them were, you know, six-ish feet. But really, like, the furthest one away was maybe eight or ten feet. And these are kids in, like, their, you know, early teens, you know, 13, 14. And it was just a really easy, it was something that just clicked and stuck and made so much sense for me that I just had to share it. So then what he had us do for the next step, So we were all standing there, you know, if my camera is the cup, we were all standing there and we all just kind of underhand with our shoulders and our chest facing the cup. We just bowled it out there like you would with a bowling ball. And then his next step was, okay, now address an imaginary golf ball. So now we all turn and now we have our shoulders, our hips, our toes all pointing at the cup. And then he said, now do the same thing. Take a golf ball in your hand and just toss it out there. Lo and behold, it worked really well. And then he started talking to us about, you know, the speed that you would move through 
to throw that ball out and get it to roll out onto the green is roughly the same speed that your hands should be moving when you have a club in them. And when you start thinking about the physics behind it, and I know I've got a couple engineers in my audience, when you start thinking about the math behind it and the transfer of energy, if you make good contact, it's going to be an almost, you know, it's going to be a very clean transfer of that energy from your hands through the club, through the club head, into the ball, and out toward the green or toward the cup. So that process was something that, again, super incredibly basic, but it's something that always, always stuck with me to the point of earlier this year when I was really struggling on the greens and when I was really struggling around the greens, I went back and I just went to the edge of my practice green with like a case of golf balls and I just threw them out there just one at a time. I just practiced with, you know, my shoulders, hips and toes pointing toward the target, just practiced throwing them out there. I would throw like two or three and then I would put one down and I would hit it. And I would throw two or three and I'd put one down and I would hit it. And it was a way for me to very easily kind of establish what I, you know, what I was familiar with in terms of my chipping so I could get back on the ball. Now, this is something that you could do. You can kind of mentally think about as well if you have a very long putt. So if you've got like a 40, 50, 60 foot putt, you know, you just rolled onto the green and the pins, you know, on the other side of the continent. It's not a bad mentality to think about for your long putts. How hard would I have to throw this underhand to get it to roll 40, 50, 60 feet? And then you just replicate that pace with your hands when you're holding the putter. So it's a really, really neat concept. I encourage you to try it. It Obviously, it's something that's very easy to do. It's not difficult practice. It's not a difficult thing to set up. But just as kind of an add-on, you always need to measure your practices. You have to have some component or of pass or fail. Now, you can determine what level of chipper you are to determine how big of a circle you might want to create. But that's what I would do. I would start with, do this 10 times, throw one, chip one, throw one, chip one. And you measure how many times you're inside of this circle. If you only have like a green side chip, I would suggest making that circle somewhere in the, you know, five to six foot radius. So 10 to 12 feet in diameter. That way, you know that if the ball ends in that circle, you've got a pretty strong chance of making that putt and converting on your up and down. So if you can continually do that, if you get, you do your 10 and you have 80% of those that you chipped landed inside of that circle, fantastic. That circle's actually too big for you then. We always want to work in, in a 30 to 70% success range. If we're under 30%, we've made the challenge too hard and we're not learning. If we're succeeding more than, more than 70% of the time, then we've made the challenge too easy we're not learning. It's like asking Steph Curry to do a layup. That doesn't help his basketball game. It stretches out his muscles. It gets his heart going, but it doesn't help his basketball game. You know, doing all the crazy spin-off one hand, like dribbling a tennis ball in one hand and a basketball in another, that's what helps his game. He has made a mundane action, like chipping, more difficult than it really is. And so we can do that by creating an area of pass versus fail. So our pass is that, you know, 10 foot wide circle around the cup. And then if we can convert somewhere between 30 and 70% of the time, beautiful, we're learning. If you progress and you keep doing it and you're getting better and better and better, awesome. As soon as you convert more than 70% of your shots, then you need to shrink the circle and make it harder. Now maybe it goes down to eight feet. And then you just start that whole process over again. So it's, you know, it's through failure-based practices like that, that you are going to become a better golfer. You know, this is one simple mentality, one simple practice that we're talking about in terms of how to gauge touch on a chip shot or an extremely long putt. But you pair this with failure-based practice and you can apply this to all of your game. And it will make you so much better under pressure on the course. 
you won't even recognize yourself. You know, when people come to me and they say, Hey, like I'm a driving range pro, but I'm a disaster on the golf course. That's the first thing I say, what does your practice look like? Because if you're just going and hitting a seven iron until it feels good, you're not going to get any better. You know, what you're doing is you're training your brain then that it's okay to get it right the third time or the fifth time or the 10th time rather than the one time you have on the golf course. So that's why we do things like this. But I'm starting to veer away from the overall topic of Hale Irwin being a genius and giving us a very simple tip of just throwing a ball underhand to help us figure out pacing and touch on and around greens. So I hope you like that one. Uh, the question for the day in this podcast is what, and again, leave your leave your comments in the YouTube comments below or as a review on Apple podcasts or Spotify, wherever you listen. But what is your one golfer that you would like to see playing live? Now it has to be someone who's alive. You're watching them in their current being. So if you say you want to watch the golden bear, you're watching an elderly bear play still obviously very cool, but just to kind of put some parameters around it. Who would you want to see play right now? All right, everybody till next time. I'll catch you in the short grass. Cheers.